Good afternoon. My name is John Jeffries. I'm introducing uh, Robert Post. Ro Robert Post is the dean of the Yale Law School. I think he also might be called the dean of First Amendment scholarship. At least if you exclude the claims of others in this room who might plausibly claim that mantle, we, ha we, have, them, we have them all here. He is a scholar of uh, exceptionally broad range. Legal history, most especially the Taft Court, equal protection, European Union law, and of course, free speech and its relation to our government and to our nation. Lumpers and splitters divide these things into more or fewer categories. I'm kind of a lumper myself, and it seems to me to, to state it simply that I can look back over three different kinds of free speech arguments from time to time. A long time ago, free, free speech law tended to be definitional, and it just turned on a distinction between speech, protected, versus content, not protected. I think that's become rather discredited, at least in academic circles, although it continues to be an argument of last resort in certain contexts, including sometimes campaign finance. And then there are arguments, as one would, one would think inevitable in con law, which is basically about what kinds of justifications the government has to have for certain actions. There are arguments about the strength and the nature and the weight of the government's justification and what kinds of justifications suffice and in what circumstances. Those arguments are embarrassed, I guess one might say, by history because for such a long time, even fairly flimsy government justifications were thought good enough and that has given the whole uh, mode of reasoning a history to live down. More recently, I suspect, there is difficulty from the other side of the spectrum. I mean, Justice Brennan said that, yes, you could restrict speech if someone was going to publish the location of a troop ship already at sea during time of war. I think he may have set the standard so high that it can never be met. In campaign finance, one of the most interesting things, it seems to me, is the degree to which the argument about justification turns on finding free speech in the justification as well as in the activity. That is, that campaign finance is thought by many to be special precisely because the justification is not a justification arising from public order, for example, or for government secrecy, for example, but a justification that arises at least in part from notions of a well-functioning system of free speech. And then there are the arguments which turn and develop toward a, a purposive view of the First Amendment, thinking of the Constitution and its provisions as aimed at some state of affairs that should be created and maintained. And it is, it is in this broad category that Robert Post's work on public discourse fits most naturally. He has written broadly and deeply about speech that facilitates the kind of informed decision making that should underlie democratic self-government. He's not the first to toil in that vineyard. Michael John years ago wrote in a vein that one might think of as similar. But even Michael John was no match in subtlety, in nuance, in historical sensitivity and detail and in sustained intellectual sophistication for the views of Robert Post. He's our speaker for lunch, and we're delighted to have him. Um, thank you, John. I think it's fair to say I agree with John in almost all things, beginning with his article way back when. On commercial speech, as uh, as as uh, Fred was saying, this is an occasion in which uh, uh, Dean Jeffries can say, "I, I told you so." Um, we are having a crisis of uh, of commercial speech now. It's manifested in many ways, including the question of compelled commercial speech. But I think it's part of a larger crisis of the First Amendment itself. 
um, because we actually don't know what we're applying the First Amendment to or what tests to apply in any number of doctrinal areas, including this one. So I, I am going to try to place uh, the topic of, uh, of today after these morning's uh, excellent discussions um, in, in, um, in, uh, and do exactly what uh, Dean Jeffries predicted I would do, try to place it in some kind of a purposive understanding of why we have protections for uh, freedom of speech uh, to begin with. Um, I would just note that the, the way in which the crisis of commercial speech is unfolding, it is threatening to undo regimes, long-standing regimes of regulation ranging from the uh, FTC to the FDA to the SEC to the regulation of, of data flows. And even, I would suggest to you, if you think about it uh, deeply enough, uh, to campaign finance and decisions like uh, Citizens uh, United. And this is manifested in many doctrinal confusions, like the difference between compelled speech and and the pro prohibition of speech, like the, distinct, like the application of tests like content discrimination to commercial speech, like the disintegration of the fact-opinion distinction in the context of commercial speech, and so on. I, what I will try to do is explain you know, how, how these developments are, are connected. So um, to me, one cannot understand the present crisis of commercial speech or how commercial speech should be treated either in the form of prohibition or in the form of compulsion until one understands why one is protecting commercial speech in the first place. So Fred has talked earlier about First Amendment opportunism. To call it opportunism is to assume that we know the right place and the wrong place for First Amendment rights to apply. And that's precisely the question that we're thinking about today. Where do they apply? And it is plainly the case that they're influenced by many sociological factors, um, including the presence of well-paid uh, lawyers like Gibson Dunn, who are now making First Amendment claims. Um, but um, uh, uh, I think in, if we're going to think about it as citizens, or if a judge is going to think about it, they have to begin from first principles, which is why is it that we protect speech? And as you know, uh, speech protection in the United States begins. Uh, it begins uh, actually the first time you have a First Amendment opinion that theorizes why we should protect speech. It's it's, um, it's November 1919 in the Abrams dissent by Oliver Wendell Holmes. It very quickly, by Gilbert versus Minnesota, moves into a political rationale. The first decisions protecting speech in the United States at the Supreme Court level, at the federal level, are, are done on a political rationale. I think of Stromberg versus California and so forth. We protect speech in order to uh, have a democracy, is what the early cases said. And almost all of the decisions that you can think of, the First Amendment decisions you can think of, uh, up, until, um, uh, up until the second half of the 20th century are uh, concerned speech that is more or less political, involving uh, uh, political positions about what the government should and shouldn't do. Um, but in 1976, the Supreme Court, for the first time, in a case called Virginia uh, Board of Pharmacies, decided to extend the protections of the First Amendment to commercial speech. And as you heard this morning, heretofore, uh, in the Valentine case and so forth, the court had said, what are you talking about? Advertisements are not protected by freedom of speech. That's not what the First Amendment was about. So we have an implicit image. The First Amendment is about something. It doesn't include advertisements. 1976, the court suddenly reverses gears on, in a Blackman opinion and says, yeah, it should. It should concern uh, advertisements. And when uh, Blackman tries to explain why, he gives two different reasons. The first reason has to do with the fact that in a market economy, we need the efficient trans transmission of information to have a, an efficient economy. He says p consumers need to know what they're buying, where the best prices are, or the economy will be inefficient. Now, many things could be said about that reasoning. Could be right, could be wrong. I, I'm assuming that information transparency is, uh, all things considered, a good thing and promotes efficiency. But uh, it's not clear to me what efficiency has to do with the First Amendment and why the First Amendment would have as its one of its principles an efficient market, considering that often we make the market inefficient. We redistribute, we do all sorts of things to the market uh, um, that may not promote efficiency. And that doesn't seem to be a constitutional issue on the one hand, and it certainly doesn't seem to be a First Amendment issue on the other. So he gives us a second, um, a second reason, which 
uh, it, uh, when he states this for the first time, he states it very modestly. But I think part of the crisis that we're now facing with commercial speech is that this rationale has now come into its own. And the second rationale he gives is citizens in a democracy need information. They need to have the information in order to make decisions, political decisions. Just to pick a simple example, uh, we need to know whether we need to have, uh, we need to impose uh, price controls on energy. We need to know what the price of gasoline is. If I can't know what the price of medicine is, I don't know whether I'm going to want to have public health care or not because I don't have the information, the market information necessary for me to make the political decisions about whether to regulate um, the markets. That's, that's the rationale that, um, that Blackman puts on the table in a very offhand sort of way. Uh, subsequent uh, decisions have, uh, of the court have reinforced that, most uh, centrally Central Hudson, which talks about commercial speech being protected because of its informative function. That is to say, it transmits information which people need in a democracy in order to make political decisions. Uh, Bilotti, the Bilotti case also explicitly ration, rationalizes commercial speech protections for this reason. So we protect uh, the transmission of commercial information, not for the speaker, but for the information it provides to the audience, to the listener. These are, uh, this is a listener-oriented rationale for speech. And in this, it differs quite dramatically from the rationale, rationales and reasons which we give to protect what we would call ordinary free speech protections. And I take it when uh, Fred was referring to First Amendment opportunism, he had in mind the thing which was not opportunistic, which is classic protections for political speech. I want to make a speech supporting uh, George Bush. I want to make a speech supporting Hillary Clinton. Whatever it is, that would be the heart of the First Amendment. It would not be opportunism to apply First Amendment rights to such speech. And what is the nature of protections applied in that context. I'm going to speak very quickly. Of course, I can take questions about any of this, but all of it would require a much longer time than I have to develop. But let me just give the salient points. So um, uh, in, in my view, uh, if you look at the contours of First Amendment protection as they developed historically in the 1920s and 30s, um, as, they, um, um, as they unfold their, uh, the, their doctrinal contours, uh, it has a particular justification. The justification that we use um, to protect speech is that we live in a democracy. A democracy means we govern ourselves. How do we govern ourselves when, in fact, I disagree with more than one half of what my government does? In what sense is the government governing for me when they have this kind of foreign policy and I want that kind of a foreign policy? Um, the answer is, and the answer that's been given in every developed country, I would say, uh, in democratic country in the 20th century, is um, I don't uh, identify with the particular decisions of my government, because quite often I don't. I identify with the processes by which government decision making takes place. That's not to say I identify with the decisions. It's not a voting issue. I identify with the processes through which government decision takes place, and those processes are most uh, dramatically concerned public opinion. The picture is I can freely participate in the formation of public opinion. We construct a government which is responsive to government opinion, and hence my speech has the potential of influencing the government. This creates in me a form of identification with my government as potentially answerable to me, call that democratic legitimation, and the function of free speech rights is to provide democratic legitimation. It's to make, the, make me have a relationship with my government where I can potentially identify with it because I can affect it, because I can participate in the public opinion to which it will be in some way answerable. And this form of understanding uh, core, let's put it this way, core free speech rights, I think uh, explains a lot of its properties. The first is it's speaker oriented. You know, it, it's not about the listener necessarily getting information, although that's part of it. It's my ability to speak so I can make the government responsive to me. Second, it's, con it's derived from the notion of democratic self-governance. What is the notion of democratic self-governance? I govern myself. I decide what I want to be. That's an autonomy notion. So when I'm participating in public discourse, I'm going to use the words public discourse to refer to the forms of public par opinion participation that are protected by the First Amendment or covered by the First Amendment. In those instances, I perceive myself and the First Amendment perceives me as autonomous. Right? I am making my own fate. I'm autonomous. That's what a democracy means. Take that uh, and contrast that picture of the person to the picture of you when you go to your doctor and you say, it hurts here. What should I do? 
The law does not picture you as autonomous, although it requires informed consent. The law pictures you as relying on the advice of your doctor. You are, you are connected to your doctor, you're relying on your doctor, and the law will protect that relationship of reliance, not within the realm of public discourse where you are autonomous and you are caveat emptor and you're trying to make the government um, responsive to you. And as a result of that, for example, at least up to now, up to now, when a doctor gives you an opinion and it's malpractice, you know, he says, cut off your left arm and it should have been your right arm and you get harmed because of this speech, uh, the doctor doesn't get a First Amendment defense because the state wants to enforce the dependability of the doctor's advice. And so it, it's not about public opinion formation. It's about, it's about reliance. Now, you take that same doctor and they give the same advice on the Oprah Winfrey show. Um, there are many examples of this. Take Laetrile, take you know, apricot pits to cure your cancer. And if the doctor says that over the Oprah Winfrey show and somebody takes uh, apricot pits and doesn't get treated, that doctor will have a First Amendment defense, not in the context of the physician-patient relationship, because that's one of dependence, but will have a First Amendment defense saying exactly the same words, causing almost the same harm to some member of the audience, say that doctor will have a First Amendment defense. Why? Because he's trying to form public opinion about what causes or doesn't cause or cures cancer. And as a result of that, people in public discourse imagined as autonomous, they take their own risk by believing what someone says on the Oprah Winfrey show. Second, um, we have in the, in the realm of public opinion formation, we have equality. Everyone is equally entitled to have the government responsive to them. So we have a form of political equality, which means everybody gets to participate equally, which means we translate that in First Amendment doctrine, no content discrimination, no viewpoint discrimination. I can't stop you from participating in public discourse because of what you say. Because no matter what you say, you have an equal right with everybody else to try to get the government to, uh, to um, be responsive to you. The constitutional stakes of ordinary First Amendment rights in public discourse are democratic legitimation, that everyone should feel the possibility that they live in a democracy in which the government is answerable to them. And finally, we see in ordinary First Amendment doctrine a very strong boundary between public and non-public. If I say something publicly, if I'm trying to affect public opinion, if I'm giving out leaflets to the public, there's one set of First Amendment rules to apply, but if they're private communications, if they're done, say, between uh, 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 um, a doctor and a patient, or between a, a product manufacturer and their consumer, not public in the sense of public opinion, um, you will not tend to see First Amendment protections apply, and that's because the object of the protection is extends to public opinion formation and not forms of speech outside. Now, I want to say, as a general matter, we need some sort of division like this in First Amendment doctrine because everything we do as human beings is done through the fact of communication. That's what it means to say we are social animals. We don't do anything without communicating to another human being unless we're feral. And there's no one in this room who's feral. And unless we want constitutional rights of First Amendment to apply to everything, we need to know and we need to have boundaries where they do and where they don't. It means nothing to say, I'm speaking. You have to be speaking in a way that involves the constitutional values which the First Amendment is designed to protect. Now, in each one of these respects, the early commercial speech cases formed an exception, which is one of the reasons why Dean Jeffries um, objected to it. So, um, uh, I protect speech in public uh, discourse so that I can feel that the government is uh, responsive to me. If that's your reason, then I'm going to protect you both from prohibitions on your speech and from compelled speech. If I compel you to speech in public discourse, I'm making you make the government responsive to something that's not you. So compelled speech is equally prohibited with non-compelled speech because the object is my own relationship to my own speech that I feel that my speech uh, makes the, uh, gives me ownership of the authorship or authorship of government opinions. 
in the world of commercial speech, we are not protecting speech because of the speaker's autonomy. We're protecting speech because of the informative function. It gives the audience more information. So in the early commercial speech cases, like Zotterer that you heard Leslie talk about this morning, there, of course there's no constitutional problem in giving more information that adds to the constitutional value if the constitutional value is the dissemination of information to the general public so that the general public can be better informed in making public decisions. We also permitted, in, and still do permit, in commercial speech, content discrimination. So why is that? Because it's, everyone doesn't have political equality. Political equality is not a value that is at issue in commercial speech. What's at issue is the information in the public. So the state can intervene to make sure that, as, as the Supreme Court once put it, the stream of information flows cleanly as well as fully. Right? It, if I give you misleading speech, if I give you speech which is possibly false, um, I can regulate you um, because the whole point is to ensure that the public is well informed. So we see many forms of content discrimination and content regulation in commercial speech in the early days, no problem. Third, what's at issue in the, in the protection of commercial speech? It's, the, it's informing the public. It's not the democratic legitimation of the state. The democratic legitimation of the state is a very important fact in a world, in a country like the United States where black helicopters are always at the horizon. It is not so important in countries, say, like France or Great Britain, where democratic legitimation is not so much at stake. In the United States, a deeply libertarian country, a country inherently and always suspicious of government, you need more freedom of speech in order precisely to bring the government closer to the people. Um, so we have doctrines like prior restraint doctrines, chilling effect doctrines, overbreath doctrines, we could go into it, all of which express the vital importance of democratic legitimation to speakers. We have none of those doctrines, or had none of those doctrines, in, uh, in commercial speech doctrine. There was a prior restraints were permitted, it was, uh, there was no overbreath, there was no chilling effect analysis, none of that doctrine obtained in commercial speech, I would say, until about the last um, decade. Um, and finally, I would say that the bounds of what commercial speech uh, were were extremely unclear uh, in the early days of commercial speech. It was the court said time and time again, you heard the definition this morning, it, it applies just to an advertisement. You know, I'm offering you five toothpicks for 10 cents. It's an offer of a good for a certain price, and that was the core meaning of commercial speech. It never actually only meant that, but the court kept saying that, but they kept applying it to forms of speech which could in no way be described that way. And we can see why that ambiguity happened um, early on in the commercial speech area, because if you're imagining the constitutional function as being the dissemination of information so the public can be better educated, that happens in many, many ways other than advertisements. That happens, for example, in data flows. You see the Sorrell case now. But the commercial speech area is expanding, and you see Central Hudson and commercial speech cases apply to areas that on nobody's account could possibly be considered commercial speech. You see it applied to the speech between physicians and patients. Why? Because in this whole class of cases, we have the same constitutional function at stake, which is the distribution of information. The distribution of information is not democratic legitimation, but it happens in many sectors of society. And in all of those sectors of society, you see now litigation arising in which this constitutional value is in place. So that boundary issue at the, at the origin was rather tightly but confusedly set in terms of commercial advertising. It very quickly began to disintegrate, and now we see it in full-scale um, route. Now, why has commercial speech begun to expand? Why do we have the crisis that provokes this conference today? There are many, many reasons. Uh, um, you, can, uh, you can get a taste of it if you look at the jurisprudence of Rehnquist and Scalia, just for starters. So Justice Rehnquist in 1976 is a dissenter in Virginia Pharmacy. He thinks there should be no such thing as commercial speech protection. The founding fathers, he said, didn't go to war to protect the right of toothpaste advertisers to advertise fresh mouths. That's what he says. Um, he is anti-commercial uh, speech until the 1990s. He dissents in several subsequent cases. He tries to undo the doctrine from within in a case like Posadas. Around in the late 1990s, he suddenly gets the idea, you know, this could be, as Dean Jeffries um, suggested, 
it could be a form of Lochnerism if I did it the right sort of way. I could make this a mechanism of a deregulatory agenda, and he switches, and he becomes one of the strongest proponents of protections for commercial speech. Scalia, same. Scalia starts out as saying, I don't want to know these constitutional rights. I don't want commercial speech protection. He switches in the 90s, and it's plain now, I mean now looking back from 2013, it's absolutely plain that the expansion of commercial speech doctrine is associated with what we would roughly call a right-wing anti-regulatory agenda preventing the states using the fact that regulations uh, um, uh, occur through speech, about speech, as any regulation would, uh, as, a, as a hook as a way to put into a play an economic due process agenda that will undo regulations. That's one big, uh, it's one big component of it. As the right has pushed justices to the fore, so they have used commercial speech doctrine in this way. It needn't be used in this way, but it has been used in this way in the last uh, decade and a half. Second, I think there is uh, an increasing uh, uh, tendency of justices uh, not to understand what the First Amendment is about. For them, if you ask them, and even this is like a Justice Souter in the Glickman case that Fred talked about earlier, he says, well, where did, when does First Amendment doctrine come into play? He says, speech as such. Quote, speech as such. That is to say, any time there's what? Speech as such, you get a First Amendment test. That would cover everything. Every contract regulation would be a First, would be a, would be a, a First Amendment uh, 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 Problem. Every product warning case in torts would be a First Amendment. The speech as such is everything. But the judges um, don't think about this very carefully, and they say speech as such. So there's a confusion between what, between what the First Amendment is trying to do, the values, and then a bleeding out of the central case, which is democratic legitimation, to cases like commercial speech, where it has nothing whatever to do with uh, democratic legitimation. But nevertheless, the tests that implement the value of democratic legitimation are thoughtlessly, or maybe not so thoughtlessly, applied to commercial speech. So we see in the Sorrell case under Justice Kennedy, who really does, I think, think about speech as such, really does imagine that to be true, we see him applying tests that we would apply to core political speech to commercial speech. We have strict scrutiny, sort of, he sort of says, if there's speaker discrimination, if there's content discrimination. Um, we see a failure to analyze the, the agents of speech. It's one thing, I can have democratic legitimation because I'm a person. It matters to me whether the government is my government. Does it matter to Campbell Soup in the same sort of way? Probably not, because Campbell Soup is not a person that, as to which democratic legitimation works. The failure to analyze this problem leads to a whole other set of issues um, about, um, about commercial speech. I would say another reason is that um, this is now serving the commercial interests of many corporations that are fully able and capable and willing to spend a lot of money litigating. And that means these arguments in the logical form, speech, 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 speech equals speech, equals speech, of that, I would say, of that, <laughs> of that quality, but nevertheless of that form, are being put before the court and the court is, courts all over the country are being confused by them into not understanding why we protect this, where would be the boundaries if you're protecting it for this reason rather than for that reason. Finally, I would say that we are now beginning to see um, the full implications of protecting speech because of what Central Hudson calls the informative function, namely the ability of, a, of, of persons to receive knowledge. So it's beginning now to extend to professional speech, speech between doctors and patients, for example. I don't think there's anybody yet who will say a doctor deserves a First Amendment defense to a malpractice suit, but it's coming up in other ways. A different way it comes up, the state of Texas presently requires doctors to say to patients who want to get an abortion that they have the likelihood of getting breast cancer because abortions cause breast cancer. That's false. But the doctor is being required to distribute false information by statute. First Amendment issue. If that's a First Amendment issue, it has to be on the same rationale as got commercial speech off the ground in the first instance, which is the distribution of information or false information from the state. So we have what the political, I don't want to get very fancy, but the political theorist Claude Lafour, the French political theorist, called the relationship of the sphere of democracy, of power on the one hand, and the sphere of knowledge on the other, and how these two coalesce in a liberal state. This is, what, this is the larger issues that are being raised now by the expansion of, um, roughly speaking, commercial speech doctrine to areas of knowledge um, transmission. 
So how does all this relate to um, the idea of, of um, compelled speech? Well, um, in the early days, compelled speech in the commercial context was not a problem because the constitutional value was to provide information. To compel speech is to provide more information, as long as it's accurate. And so what's the issue? What's the constitutional issue? So Zouderer basically gets rid of it, but it gets rid of it with a lot, as you heard this morning from Leslie, with a lot of side language about you can only get rid of it if you uh, want to prevent people from being misled or only if it's factual, etc. And so there's, the, there's this issue now about compelling uh, persons to uh, speak in the commercial context and what should we do about it. Once you begin to lose the distinction between commercial speech and public discourse, on the other hand, um, the idea of compelled speech can come to seem very dramatic and very threatening. Um, regardless of the fact, as, as was said this morning, that we have compelled speech all the time in this society. In, in a million different contexts, we compel speech from uh, doctors reporting patients with uh, certain kinds of diseases to reporting automobile accidents to uh, juries, I mean, many, many, many contexts in which in this society we compel speech, none of which, uh, generally speaking, raises a First Amendment problem because none of which is about public discourse, right? So compelling public discourse is one thing, compelling you to sign a form, like if you're signing your name to a, a driver's license, is, is quite something else. Um, but um, so that when, once you lose this distinction, the idea of compelled speech can come to seem very threatening, and, and the courts really don't know how to deal with it. One sees, as you, as you heard this morning, tests ranging from uh, Zouderer, which basically gives it a free pass, to Central Hudson, to Maynard. It's very strict. It's worse. It's, it's worse to compel speech, say some courts. It's better to compel speech, say other courts, because they're more in touch with the informative. But there's a complete lack of consensus about what the compelled speech doctrine is supposed to be doing, or what it's supposed to be protecting, or why we're, why we're applying constitutional review to this um, in, in the first place. So um, there's this uh, the confusion of public discourse and commercial speech leads to this uh, issue. Um, United Foods is, I think, the key decision where, in a Kennedy opinion, he says, well, they can't be forced to contribute. They can't be forced to contribute to advertisements with which um, they disagree. And so that has led to a whole set of questions. So one, and I'm, I'm, this is now sort of prognosis for you looking forward about the ways in which these issues are going to be litigated. First of all, for what reasons can one compel speech? I'm always speaking now outside of public discourse. Uh, we compel speech for thousands and thousands of distinct reasons um, outside of public discourse. We do it to ensure the transparency of markets. We do it to inform consumers. Every one of you is wearing clothes. If you go back and look at the collar, it'll say made in the US or made in China or say cotton or say rayon. And that's all compelled speech and it's all done to make the market more transparent, more effective. Um, we do it for warnings, for, for, for safety. We do it for informed consent within doctor-patient relationships. Um, we do it uh, because of certain regulatory schemes. The FDA uh, requires drugs to be tested for safety and efficacy. And, the, and, and yet they also want to say, well, doctors should be trusted to prescribe drugs that haven't been tested for a certain use for what's called an off-label use. They're willing to permit that because the processes of getting approved are very expensive, a lot of transaction costs, takes a while. Um, recently, the Second Circuit has said, well, actually, you know, you can't stop a drug company from marketing a drug that is approved for one use for an off-label use. If that goes through, then the whole FDA regulatory scheme collapses because there's no incentive anymore to, uh, to get your drugs approved. And you can just, you know, get it approved for something anodyne. And then, and then market it for anything else. So that's a marketing, that's a use for um, compelling or restricting um, commercial speech. Um, we, um, uh, the genetically modified example, which came up this morning. You know, we want consumers to know what they're eating, maybe. We want to inform them. Uh, calorie, po calories at point of disclosure, same thing. Now that could be uh, theorized as a public health issue. It could be theorized as empowering consumers. It could be theorized as saying, do we want to have laws about genetically modified? There's a lot of interests which are serving all of that. Which of these interests are going to actually be able to justify compelled commercial speech? That's going to be um, a set of questions that are plainly coming forward um, in the future. And the court right now has this tendency to view everything through the lens of paternalism. You know, if you're forcing someone to disclose calories, it's paternalistic to the 
uh, to the consumers. They maybe don't want to know what they're eating. You know, it's their autonomy rights to eat blindly or something like that. You're, you're going to see a lot of that uh, from the court because they're imagining this in the context of public discourse and they can't see, to use a word I've used before, they can't see they're dealing in different domains which have different logics and invoke and involve different values. Um, second, you're going to see an issue about what kind of speech can be compelled, facts or opinions. So um, I think I think it's going to be relatively easy uh, for the state to compel the disclosure of accurate facts made in China, you know, 100% rayon or whatever it is that you, I, I don't think that, I, 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 I find it difficult to believe, optimist that I am, that the court will put much uh, barrier in the way of disclosing uh, plain facts. But the question is, not all facts are plain facts. Some facts are more like opinion, like eat beef. And this is, that's what that's what United Food raised. It raised the issue of um, are mushrooms good for you? You know, advertising mushrooms that the, uh, that it's that it's desirable rather than it's a, a fact about mushrooms. And so uh, enforcing those forms of uh, compelled speech, I think, is going to raise much higher constitutional problems. And that is going to raise this issue: How do we conceive the commercial speaker? So if we conceive the commercial speaker as not having an autonomy interest about whether or not to speak, because I can force the commercial speaker to reveal all kinds of facts, like if you're going to buy a house, the person you're buying the house from has to reveal a lot of facts to you. If I'm forcing that person to reveal a lot of facts to you, am I conceiving them as autonomous or not? In the First Amendment area, we do not permit compelled speech because we imagine the person as autonomous. So is the house vendor conceived as autonomous or not when the house vendor is required to give you all the facts about the house that you want to buy? Um, there is going, and, and that issue is going to come up one way on the question of facts and another way on the question of opinions. And that distinction is going to be important, but also how we imagine the speaker as having these autonomy interests or not, and why do we imagine the person as having autonomous interests. And that, of course, is going to split as between natural persons or expressive associations on the one hand, and on the other hand, corporate entities like General Electric. Does General Electric have an autonomous interest, an autonomy interest not to give you facts, or not to be forced to give you opinions like uh, save energy or something like that? Th those, those battles are going, to come, uh, are, are going to be coming to the forefront, and they're going to raise the issue of who a speaker is for purposes of constitutional law. They're not all the same. And uh, what, how we're going to define the intersection of different kinds of speakers with different kinds of values. Um, third issue is, it, once we imagine this more generally as the informative function, and not as about advertising, because in the long run, who cares about advertising? What they care about is the information that goes. We can see that information is conveyed in a lot of ways other than what you and I would call speech. The Sorel case uh, um, coming out of Vermont was about the sale of databases. No one's talking in a database. No one, this is not speech. This is the transmission of information. But in an information society, everything is information. Everything you do can be reduced to bits and bytes, and I can disclose the information about it. So if we're talking about the regulation of information flows and putting constitutional restrictions on them of this kind, it's going to raise enormous issues about who can and can't put restrictions or be required to disclose information sources. That, those are going to be rather large issues in the future that, that come out of this. Um, I should say also, it raises a very typical First Amendment issue, which is who is a speaker and who's not. So is a common carrier, like a telephone company, a speaker? Or is the common carrier a common carrier, like you know, they're giving you a railroad car rather than speaking? The, um, the Verizon issue at root is, it rests on matters of constitutional characterization of what does it mean to speak versus providing the information or vehicle for other persons to speak. This is a big issue. It's going to be coming up a lot in the corporate context that we're, that we're talking about. So um, I suppose that's really what I wanted to say to provoke discussion and among you all and answer questions.